be that 15% social security tax. So let's say you net out $100,000 net income. You bring 140 in, you pay all your expenses, you have a $100,000 bottom line. On a LLC sole member as a 1099 Schedule C, you're going to pay $15,000 of social security taxes. On the other side of it, if you were a subchapter S corporation and you say you put yourself on $40,000 of payroll, the other $60,000 remaining money, you don't have to pay that 15%, you save $9,000 in taxes. Now, Social Security will be there and has to be there by law. You want to pay into Social Security something because it's a nice supplement to your retirement. You don't want to retire on Social Security, it's not the way to retire. But the thing is, it has to be there by law. The problem with Social Security is broke. Why is it broke? Well, one, the, the people are living longer. So they put Social Security in effect. People that, that 65 you collected, people are live, average age people live to is 54 years old, 56 years old, excuse me, 56 years old. Now the average age is 77. So there's a 21 year dif differential there now. Okay, it's a lot more people collecting Social Security than were in the past. Another thing, people are having less kids. Less kids, less workers, less people paying into Social Security. So Social Security's having a hard time. That's why they keep raising the age of Social Security. And every year they keep raising it, so you're chasing after that. I mean, if you're, you're 30 some years old now, you're probably gonna be 70, 72 years old before you collect Social Security. That alone, they're gonna tell you how much you can collect. You die, it goes away. So it's not really a great retirement account. You don't wanna bank on that, but it's nice to have. So I'd like to see people, they, they did this best, take that extra money, put it in your own retirement account. You put it in your own retirement account. Now you can take it out when you're 59 and a half years old, take as much out as you want to. When you die, it goes to your heirs. It's just a good way of saving money. Medicare tax is 3% of that 15%. Okay, Medicare tax is, is the worst. Because if you make half a million dollars, I make $50,000, you're paying $15,000 of Medicare tax, I'm paying 1,500 in Medicare tax. You don't get a gold card when you retire. You don't have better coverage than I have. We have the same exact coverage. So why would you ever want to pay more money into Medicare for no reason? So if you have the opportunity to become an LLC and have your, you know, the main brokerage house pay your LLC, it's definitely the way to go, hundred percent. Okay, but if you're a New Jersey resident and you yeah. work for a brokerage who has a PA base, can you set up an LLC in PA? So, yes, you can set the LLC up, but it's it's not going to fly with the state so much. If the state audit you, um, what you can do is you just collect all your money. You collect all your money as a, as an individual, then put it into your LLC yourself. Okay, and then do all these things in the LLC that way. Okay. Um, the state of New Jersey, for some reason, just does not does not like to see that. Okay. All right. So that's something maybe if, if we have any New Jersey residents here, they could talk to their accountant about. They'll talk to their accountant. They want to do that. Some people like to be that creative or want to do that. Um, be careful when you talk to an accountant or talk to a, a lawyer. They'll, they'll set the LLC up, but they won't take that subchapter S election. The reason you want to be a subchapter an LLC first because they can be taxed any way they want to be taxed. So that's that's a major thing right there. Number two, LLCs don't have to follow all the rules that corporations have to follow. They're the same for Texas as corporations, but they do not need to follow all the legal laws. Like for instance, have a meeting once a year for your corporation. Um, you know, different. Uh, you know, different uh, announcements and pronouncements if you through a corporation. You don't have to do that. They make it simple. You really get your corporate kit. You go through it once. You put it. You put it away, and that's it. There's no corporate resolutions for every time you do something outside the box with an LLC. Okay. That's to make it easy. But LLC, again, is taxed like a sole proprietor until you make that election be taxed as a subchapter S corporation. Okay. What questions should should agents be asking if they're going to be meeting with their um, their tax professionals? What questions should they be asking to ensure that these things are covered? Well, first, I mean, first, I would think that they should, if they're in Pennsylvania. Ask if you can 
you know, ask your brokerage you know, house if you they will allow, you know, allow you to become an LLC, which they more nine times out of ten they will. Talk to your accountant to come into the LLC. Take that subchapter S election. Um, get yourself on payroll for something, and then start putting all your expenses to your corporation. Both New Jersey and PA. I mean, you know, you got to talk to your accountant. You got to talk to your accountant in the sense that you want to make sure that you make you pick up all the expenses you can pick up. Okay. Quick question. Um, I'm sorry. Good, you are. You got okay. Um, yeah. So I represent new agents, right? I, I do a lot of work with newer agents, and okay. when I hear things like accounting and all of this stuff you're speaking of, again, I I understand it, but most people do not. So what would be like? the top five things that you believe that a new agent needs to understand when they become a real estate agent? Because again, a lot of the things that you're speaking about, we are businesses and we need to act like businesses, but majority of the agents that we see, they come from a nine to five workplace and they have trouble uh, understanding that they are a business and how to operate like one until <laughs> things go crazy or or, or something pops you just up interrupted they him in the are not really maximizing on certain things and they realize it 10 years later when so they didn't ask what, what would be something that i can bring question, back to my the subject agents and, and i deal with agents nationwide so i understand do that you? certain states oh, don't allow you to do the llc thing yeah. but outside of that what what would be something uh, you know, just five things off the top so, of your he head. He went to this. Uh, five things go off your long ass question. Interrupt thing. I mean, you know, a better the main speaker when they first start out. Okay. First and foremost, keep good records. Record keeping is key to any, anything. Um, you know, you're required to keep receipts, the actual receipts for five years. So your credit card bills don't count. Um, your, your bank statement showing debits coming out does not count. You need the actual receipts. Those actual, are the actual receipt, like the so actual receipt, the actual receipt. Paper That's, receipt. It can be scanned in the computer. Okay. It's got to be the actual receipt. So take a picture of it and, and email Keep it to that you receipt. so you have it. I always say you go to Sears and buy a computer or you buy underwear. You can't write the underwear off, but you can write the computer off. I got you. Okay. So you got to make sure you have those receipts. They, they can see Sears on the credit card bill, you know, $2,000, but they know that you bought. They want to see what you actually bought there. Okay. Um, try to separate. So one, that'd be the first thing. Keep me cheese. Number two would be try to separate your personal life from your business life. Like if you're going to use a credit card or a debit card, you'll make one for the business and one for personal. Okay. And there's going to be some overlapping. If that happens, it's okay. If you do your own credit card, if the credit card's in place, those things happen. But try to keep those things separate because in the case you have or have an audit, okay, it makes things a lot cleaner to say, here's my records and everything ties in. You know, I have backup receipts. Here's all my separate records for my business, my personal stuff. There's nothing written off, off over there. Once you start to commingle that or mix that up, it makes things a little harder to do for. Also, easy for your accountant to look through things. So they look through things that way now. They'll see that and they can see that, you know, everything's right there for them. A good computer system works out. Boy, and that could be, you know, for you guys, I mean, especially people who are just uh, a Schedule C or a 1099, yeah, yeah, it, a, an Excel spreadsheet is perfect. You know, the, one of the worst things you do is come to an accountant this time of year and hand us a box of receipts. You know, we're already working 80, 90 hours a week right now. We don't want to see a box of receipts. You come out of a spreadsheet that shows, you know, here's my office expenses, my dues, my meals, you know, my MOS fees, and you just have the columns and just have them all nice and total up, that's the way to go. Or a QuickBooks printout. QuickBooks is a great program. Google Docs, I think Google Sheets is like a free version. That's, that's free. And I'm always looking for something that's free because majority, again, uh, you know, an average agent income is about 40 grand a year. Yep. So a lot of this stuff, I like to always showcase things that are very easily accessible. So Google Sheets, I I'm writing these things down. Is there okay. Right? Points. That's, that's that's fine. But the thing is, clean records is the one biggest thing. All three of those I just talked about were clean records. Okay. And you gotta start thinking outside the box of it too. Like be realize that you know you are a business. So when it comes down to things like a pencil, it's a write-off. You know, you buy a new phone, a write-off. So like, we were asking about courses, that would be a write-off. Hundred percent. So I mean, anything, anything 
what happens though a lot of times with people is they, they, they'll give me the courses, they'll give me the MLS, they'll give me a stripper key, they'll give me, you know, uh, mileage, but then they kind of forget that they bought a computer that year. You know, they kind of forget that they don't give me their cell phone number, their cell phone bills. And they don't give us the internet bills, um, you know, where they bought a scanner. You know, those type of things people kind of forget. Like, if you're actually buying something for your business, and it's literally like legitimately for the like, I'm buying this, I'm taking it to the open house, I'm showing clients, that stuff's a write off. You know, at the same time, you buy your kid an iPad, and it could be a write off also, because you probably use the iPad too. You're probably picking it up and using it at some point. So, those type of things, I mean, you know, you can't buy 15 iPads, but you can buy three iPads in a year because you're having clients walk around with them. You know, think about it, like, you know, try to relate things that relate expenses to your business that you can actually try to relate and say, you know what? Yeah, I could use this for my business. Let's write this off. Because, and that would include a home office too. So home offices are pretty hard to take with realtors. You guys do have a desk at an office. So IRS will not allow home offices with realtors. Uh, and that's, that there's many uh, court cases against that. Oh. Right, that's why you take your cell phone bill, you take your internet bill, okay, uh, and you know, those kind of things. But unfortunately, they, they won't allow that because nine times out of ten, you have a desk someplace. Okay. Uh, and also, I think agents do a lot of um, meals and entertainment. Yep. So the meals and entertainment, again, you got to keep those receipts. But on that receipt, you need to put a name on there, who you're with. Okay. Um, so I always tell people do it that night. <laughs> so you're not going back, you know, five, you know, two years later trying to figure that out. Um, they're not going to call that person. I've never seen that ever happen. So it could be, you know, I, I'm at dinner and Alicia puts my name down and I was there with her. They, they don't know who I'm with two years prior. So the thing goes down to is that, uh, yeah, you got to put a name down and keep those receipts also. Okay. But is there a, a window, um, or... Does that have to be specific? Could it be a lunch? Could it be a happy hour? Could it could it be, be anything. It could be anything. Okay. It could be coffee at Starbucks in the morning. It could be, you know, a fine dining at night that costs a thousand dollars. Okay. Um, that's going to be each person. I remember I started off saying like snowflakes, how comfortable you feel writing some things off. Um, it's also comes down to I think the amount of money you bring in. So if you're doing two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year and you know, commissions, you could have fifteen, twenty thousand dollars of you know, of uh, um, meals and entertainment, but you couldn't have fifteen thousand dollars you're doing forty thousand. Mm. Doesn't make any sense. Okay. Um, so the thing would be is just you gotta think about how you're doing that year, what how things are going. You know, also stay away from like birthdays. Okay, like don't like you go to dinner on your birthday, you try to write that off, they know it's your birthday. Don't do that. You know, the holidays, stay away from those. You're not going out with clients on Christmas or, or Easter or Hanukkah. You're not doing those things. So, you know, keep keep track of those too. So they would be a red they would be a, a red flag. It like, would be. I mean they audited. Correct. Correct. Because obviously it could happen on Hanukkah or you know, well could. And I've I've been with yeah. people on Christmas Eve too, so it's definitely gonna happen. So Oh, definitely. I got one for you. Sure. What about um, virtual assistants? So, that's a good very question. Virtual switch assistants is actually an issue with the IRS right now. Um, so, if you have anybody you're paying, a virtual, virtual, not non virtual, uh, you really should issue a 1099 to that person in January. Okay, 1099s are due out the 31st. I suggest anytime you pay somebody, get the W 9 filled out. Which all it does is ask the person's name, address, and their ID number, which is most likely going to be their social security number. Get that before you pay them the first time. IRS allows you to not issue 1099s for anybody under 600 hours payment for the full year, which is great. You have 10 people making 500, you don't have to worry about it. State of New Jersey, though, however, will come in and charge you unemployment tax on that. So you have to be careful in New Jersey. The jersey takes a collective one thousand dollars for all the ten ninety nines you have, or, or subcontractors, assistants, whatever that you might have, um, and wants you to start payroll. So issue ten ninety nines is the best thing to do. 
Can an agent who's not not LLC yet issue a 1099? Can an Yep, and if there's anything okay. you should send it And under six hundred dollars. Okay, and then but oh, what anything, if, anything over six hundred. Anything over six hundred. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. And then what if the VA is overseas? Well then can't really issue ten ninety nine, so then you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> that that would probably come up through the agent if they, they want to accept or not accept that uh, deduction at that point. Okay. So they should submit that expense then. Oh yeah, definitely. I was definitely submitted. Correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I got I got another one too. Um, so I was just talking to one of my friends. He's an agent as well. Um, if you have an LLC, right, and you make over fifty thousand dollars, when you do your taxes, you should file as S corp. Yeah, that's what I was talking about prior. Correct. Okay. As I, I don't usually tell people fifty. I usually tell people twenty. Um, net right. number net number of twenty thousand. So when you hit twenty thousand dollars, the cost of being a subchapter S corporation is outweighed by the taxes you save. And what are those costs? You got to hire a payroll company. You know, five hundred thousand dollars a year. You had to have your accountant do a separate tax return. That's the corporate eleven twenty S tax return. That's going to cost you thousand two thousand dollars a year. So at twenty thousand dollars in income, okay. That's third. That's fifteen percent. That's three thousand dollars. So the two of those expenses together is what makes it that number. So if your bottom line number, so if you take fifty in and you spend forty, you don't really you should you shouldn't really be an S corporation yet. If you take fifty in and your bottom line is twenty plus, then I would suggest doing that. Gotcha. That was good. Thank you. Welcome. What if the agents do? Um, some of the agents are a realtor. Some of them are property managers. Some of them, their roles are, should they set up multiple LLCs or should it all just be under one? So, I mean, you should try to set up different LLCs because you try to protect each business from, you know, any kind of, that's, that, that's where the protection comes in, not the tax part um, comes in. I think if you're a property manager and you're a realtor, I think you're probably safe putting them in the same business um, until they get to a certain size. Okay. If all, sudden, if all of a sudden you're starting to do, um, I don't know, you know $50,000, $100,000 of different properties as a property manager, your exposure is starting to get grow a lot. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I would sit there and say I could probably separate that. But you know, a good, good thing is that you mentioned that is that some people who are might be property managers in New Jersey, they can take their you know, that bit part of their business and make that an LLC taxes, subchapter S. They can do that in New Jersey because that has nothing to do with realtors. It's like nothing to do with the board of realtor. You get paid by the property property people. Okay, got it. Hey, Paul, Mike Sellerco, how are you? I'm okay, how are you doing today? I'm doing okay. Just a few things for everybody. What I use is I use Miles IQ to track all my miles. Okay. Matter of fact, you just resubscribe for another year. Tracks all your miles. You can set it up or as if it's business or pleasure to keep things on track. Uh, I've been using I've been using QuickBooks for years, and it's, okay. it, it, it's it, it just makes it so easy for the accountant. Correct. You're right. It's it's, it, it, it's a great. Yeah, when you send them an invite, they get into it. Bing, bang, boom. It's done. It's great. Uh, uh, as far as as far as forming an LLC, as far as yes corp, all that, as far as what you just talked about, my accountant told me, as far as me being a realtor, I'm also a notary, I'm a closing agent, I have an LLC. But as far as setting things up, they told me I could use like two hundred thousand dollars as a benchmark of going LLC. The expenses of setting that up, I could like you just explain. As far as the payroll company, uh, uh, new agents, it's it's hard as hell as it is for a new agent with all their expenses, as far as business cards, signs, branding, all that kind of stuff. Now, what's your opinion as far as a as a break even point there for going LLC or just keeping it straight up? So, like I said, my break even point would be a net income of about twenty thousand dollars. Huh? A net income, okay. Twenty thousand. Yeah. So if like again, if you have fifty thousand gross, you have forty thousand expenses. Uh, no need to be an LLC. Fifty thousand dollars gross, 
30 expenses, you really should consider it. Um, it would be subchapter S, sorry, subchapter S. Um, because the amount of money you save is, is just is astronomical. And I'd rather see you take that money yourself, invest that in your own retirement accounts, and give it to the government and have them put it in Social Security. Okay. As far as the LLC, I mean, I'm a veteran. Yeah. I formed an LLC. Yeah. I, I save money in PA. I'm in PA. But, I mean, you need insurance. You need, you know, additional uh, ancillary things, if you will. Thank you. Well, you'll still be an LLC. You just take the election to be treated as a subchapter S corporation. You have that. You have the ability to make that your the LLC you have right now. You have the ability the first 75 days of any given year with an existing LLC, which takes you to March 15th to make that election for the current year. So Mike, you could actually make that election for 2023 and operate the whole year as a subchapter S corporation. Doesn't change your corporate structure at all. Your corporation, your ID number, your LLC, all still intact. There's nothing at all with your corporation, legally or anything. It just changes how you're taxed. Okay. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's, honestly, we, um, I have never lost a discussion or argument on this uh, case. Um, I probably 90% of our clients come because accounts are not telling their clients to change it over to from an LLC to a subchapter S. Okay. I'll have to look into it. And thank you, Paul. You're very welcome. Well, I got a quick question for you. So for those out there who do not know how to vet the proper accountant, what are some good questions we should be asking accountants just to make sure that accountant is not only going to give us what we need, but it'd be really creative and making sure that we have like what you're going through right now. Of course, I know you know what you're doing, but you know, there's a lot of accountants out there who don't. So how, how, how can we tell the difference between an accountant that knows what they're doing and an accountant that's just popping up playing accountant? I think I, with an accountant, you know, um, they always say you, you put a hundred accounts in a, in a room, give them the same tax return, you get 99 different answers. Okay. Good. I, I always said that. So the accounts, are, uh, I think it's more depth about somebody's going to get back to you. Somebody's going to be accessible to you. Somebody you feel comfortable with. Because um, I always say, I can't always say it, uh, easier to change your priest and your doctor than change your accountant. Because your accountant knows everything about you. <laughs> you want to be able to call your accountant and say, hey, I'm buying golf clubs. I write these off. You want to have to feel that freedom to ask that kind of question as opposed to feeling intimidated by them or not get a phone call back. So the biggest thing, find somebody you feel comfortable with, find somebody that responds back to you, gets back to you with your questions, answer your questions. As far as, you know, as far as, you know, writing this off, writing that off or what an accountant knows that comes down to, uh, I don't know, that's just hard. I mean, like, are we looking for a certain amount of years of experience? Are we looking for, are we asking these accountants, hey, listen, are you, you know, how many real estate agents do you work with? Are we asking questions like that? Or does that not matter? Because businesses are businesses. So business like, is business. Debits and credits. It's like the same thing for us. Write-offs and not write-offs. Um, you know, years of experience mean nothing. I've seen some pretty dumb CPAs out there. And I see some pretty smart accountants who never went for the CFA CPA exam. Um, you know, so it, it just comes down to, I think, how comfortable you feel with somebody. Again, I, I think I told you in the beginning, if someone says they're an expert in real, realtors, there's no such thing. There's no one's an expert in anything. You know, I'm constantly learning. You're always constantly learning. Uh, it comes down to is that you just got to find somebody that's going to get back to that. Might be one of the biggest complaints that the accountant does get back to people. Okay. Uh, we, we, got more, we have what's called a good night policy here at the firm. You're not allowed to leave this office every single phone call is returned. Okay. And then, you know, we check, I check call logs and people, my, my staff, all 60 people, I check them to make sure they return the client's calls. So um, you want to make sure people call you back. So you have a pretty big staff. So is that something that we should be looking for? Like if we reach out and the CPA, you know, comes into our world and they just, I feel like you know, just them, you know, is that something that we want to, you know, investigate it further or are we only looking at people who have larger teams and people who have like the functionality that you guys have? I started with three people. It's my mother, my father, and myself. When I started, my, my father, I started this firm. And I took it over as four people. So um, it, small firms are just as good as big firms or bigger firms. You know. Gotcha. 
Should we be auditing our, sometimes I've heard a couple people mention leading up to this webinar that like, oh, I got a guy and he just does it. They don't ask any questions. I don't, that makes me a little uncomfortable. I mean, should they, should there be a little bit more to that relationship? I think you should sit down for, for at least the first few years with your accountant and talk to them. Um, you know, after a while, it, it, with anything else, it becomes like second nature. You know that you're going to save this and save this, but, you know, give your accountant this information or that information. Uh, yeah, I would think that you would want to sit down the first year or two with somebody and sit down and talk to them, or get them on the phone at least, um, you know, so you can get a temperature of what they're going to do for you. Okay. And what would, what would one anticipate spending on a good accountant? So, um, the costs are all over the place. Uh, right now, the accounting field has become a very, very much a, a field of demand. There's 17% less accountants in the United States than two years ago. 46% less people going to school for it. Um, and it's all because of the stress that we went through the COVID. They were taking care of all the PPP loans, the EIDL, the ERC, it all fell on us. All the different rule changes. And so people just decided to leave the, the field. So prices are going up pretty high. Um, but I would think that, you know, a simple, you know, schedule C, sole proprietor, real to return with a spouse in the house, you're probably talking, you know, it should be anywhere from, you know, 350 to $500 for something like that, like those kind of returns. You get the corporate returns, there's a separate, you know, you have a subchapter S, there's a separate filing for that. There's a lot more work that goes into a corporate tax return than goes into a personal return. So you you probably talking anywhere from, you know, with including the personal return too. So corporation and, and personal return, a thousand, two thousand dollars. Uh, that's why I think it's important you know that if you make that twenty thousand dollar net income, that pays for the account and pays for the payroll company. I mean, there's people out there who will charge you five thousand dollars for corporate tax return. There's people who charge you seven hundred to a thousand dollars for personal return. You know, I built my firm based on two philosophies. One being be there for your clients. Like I told you, we call every back. Uh, the second one is, you know, charge a fair price. You got a client for 20 years, not two years. Now, so there's a philosophy that my father installed in me. We stuck, that's how I built this firm. That's amazing. Yeah. So I see here in the chat, someone asked about um, going back to the VAs, it being tricky because some of them are companies instead of an individual, but I would imagine that's kind of the same as you pay a company to do your marketing, your printing or whatever, or does that make a difference? I'm, I'm not sure what was the follow up. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. So the VAs who are overseas, sometimes they oh, come okay. through a company. You're not working with that individual. Okay. Does that change anything or is that just- No, a, that's fine. Yeah. Um, okay. Once they're overseas, you really can't send a 1099 because they don't have a, a federal ID number. Okay, so you can't do anything. So you just got to keep good records that you sent the money over there, and you're fine. Um, if they're in the United States, any individual, any LLC should get a 1099, um, unless that LLC can prove its tax as a subchapter S corporation. Corporations do not need to send 1099s to. Okay. Did I answer that question? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, and then that would, so that would apply for maybe a high school or a college student that you would hire to do tasks. Some and stuff. Sure. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. What else should we get to before, um, we wrap this my up? My time is, unfortunately, Alicia, my time is. Yeah. Supposed to be enough. I got two couple minutes left. Okay, perfect. Well, is there anything that you want to wrap it up with then? I mean, just, uh, you know, at least has my email address. If you guys want to reach out to me, it's fine. With any additional questions, no problem at all, please. Well, thank, you thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for your Hi, time. Paul. Thank you, Paul. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. I hope everybody you. got that something was out of this. That informative, Paul. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Hey, Justin. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs>